Hello, everyone, and welcome to the last segment for um, this group of videos in terms of um, if you're watching this during fall 2023. So what we're going to go into now, since we have finished up the atmosphere, is we're going to jump into climate and climate change. So before we like really get into the full um, reasoning behind climate change, natural climate change, um, and then how we know about all of these things, as well as where are we going now and where are we going into the future, um, we need to understand some basic, um, some basic things and, and kitties. You can't forget kitties, right? This is Nubbins, by the way. She's a little camera shy, but she doesn't mind. <laughs> um, so like I said, there are a few things that we need to understand before we get into all of that stuff. Um, and this is really going to start with something called the climate system. Um, so our planet is comprised of various spheres um, that all interact with each other. So these spheres include the cryosphere, the hydrosphere, the atmosphere, the lithosphere, the biosphere, and more recently, the anthrosphere. Um, so the cryosphere is ice, hydrosphere, hydrosphere is water, atmo, everything above our head, um, in terms of above, he above our head and above land and water. Um, lithosphere is everything rocks, biosphere is anything living. Um, and then, of course, the anthrosphere is the human touch. So all of these interactions that happen between these various spheres is still trying to be understood. Um, it's a, a huge aspect of, of climate research is really trying to figure out these intricacies of how um, they influence each other. So for example, um, with the hydrosphere, like with our oceanic currents, where we're bringing warm water from the equatorial regions up to the polar regions, that's a deliverance basically of warm water. That warm water can melt parts of the cryosphere, right? Like icebergs, ice sheets, um, not so much land ice because that's stored, you know, up off of out of the water. Um, but that's an example there. Or, you know, we just talked about ENSO and that's the atmosphere and the hydrosphere working congruently together. Um, the anthro or the atmosphere can influence the lithosphere, wind blown tunnels, right? So, uh, or wind blowing dust, you know, things like that. Um, and then, of course, the anthrosphere is impacting every single one of these spheres. And some of these observations are very quick to be observed. However, others are not. Um, so, like, for example, uh, the anthrosphere burning or taking out carbon dioxide from the lithosphere and burning it into the atmosphere, that, that the, the, um, the concentrations of CO2 are taking a while to really be realized into the atmosphere. And the atmosphere also reacts to that in terms of temperature change, um, which we'll get into later, whereas some things are really quick. Um, or even like uh, the hydrosphere and the lithosphere. Some of them, some of that can be a really long time, right? Like the Colorado River carving out the Grand Canyon, that didn't happen overnight. That happened over the course of millions of years. So in terms of some of these interactions um, happening quickly or not quickly, there's a term we need to understand. It's something called feedback loops. So at first, before we move into that, I want you to think about what a feedback loop could be. Think, think, think. What, what, what? What could it be? What could a feedback loop be? Think of like the term loop. Yeah? Something on the order of basically the easiest way to consider it is a loop of cause and effect. Um, and we have two categories of feedback loops. One is a positive feedback, which is something that amplifies a response. Um, and then the next is a negative feedback, one that dampens a response. So we need to break the connotations that we have in our head of what positive and negative mean, because in this case with feedback loops, positive feedbacks are not a good thing. Um, they are a reinforcing uh, sort of loop, whereas a negative feedback is something that's balancing. A way that perhaps you've encountered uh, feedback loops in your own life, you know, we've just gone through a heat wave or are still continuing to, continuing to go through a heat wave, say you're in a room with an air conditioner on, 
Um, and so it, that air conditioner is set to a particular temperature. So when the room reaches above that temperature, the air conditioning is going to kick on, right? So say a room is set to 70 degrees. If that room reaches about 72 degrees, then the air conditioning is like, oh, my time to shine has come and will turn on and will cool the room down to 70 degrees um, and then it will shut off. That's an example of a negative feedback loop. Now, if your air conditioner was broken, um, then that would be an example of a feedback, a positive feedback loop. So your air conditioner, your room gets over a certain temperature than it's supposed to, your air conditioner won't turn on, and your room gets hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter, and hotter until you get your air conditioning fixed and that loop then um, uh, is, is next. Um, so, but we're not going to talk about um, those are not, that's not an example that we use in climate change, right? But it's just one that you can think about. So we have a couple of loops that we understand pretty well um, in terms in reference to climate. Here are some examples of positive feedback loops um, in, in, our, in our world. So one that I think is really simple and very straightforward to understand is that when the temperature increases, that melts ice. Um, which means that you're reducing the amount of reflectivity that's happening. So you're lower or yeah, lowering your albedo. So less sunlight is reflected back to space. Thus more sunlight is absorbed by the earth. Thus we, in, the temperature increases more land. Ice, yeah. Land ice melts, less light is reflected back. More sun is absorbed by the earth. Temperature increases land ice melts, less reflected back to space. Um, more is absorbed by the earth. Yada, 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 blah, blah, blah. It's kind of like a, a domino effect or a snowball effect in a way. Another example um, is that temperature increasing means that evaporation can also increase, which means more water vapor is in the atmosphere, which means the greenhouse effect is enhanced. Um, if you remember when we talked about the components of the atmosphere, um, water vapor is a very, very, very strong greenhouse gas, um, meaning that it, it um, gives us back a lot of uh, a lot of heat that we're trying to lose. Um, think you can think about that with humidity, right? We talked about water vapor in the air in terms of humidity. So these are just a couple of feedback loops on Earth. Um, negative feedback loops are a little bit more complicated. Um, the one here on the right, or excuse me, left, is looking at um, if the temperature increases, then the Earth will emit more infrared radiation, which means we're going to lose more energy which means our temperature will decrease. Then our temperature will increase again, we'll emit more radiation, we'll lose more energy, thus our temperature will decrease. This is something related to what's called Planck's Law, if you're familiar with that. One that's more associated with the oceans is a little difficult. So let me, let me explain this, uh, let me explain this figure here on the right. So we have the sun which heats up the surface of the oceans, which can then attract um, plankton blooms or cause plankton blooms in a way, if there's also um, nutrients in there. So when the plankton blooms occur, they release dimethyl sulfide um, into the water, and then that dimethyl sulfide goes into the atmosphere, which acts as something called a cloud condensation nuclei so that more clouds can form. So the more clouds you form, the more reflectivity can happen, thus the cooler um, you, can, you can then get. But then the clouds can go away, the sun pops out again, heats up the surface of the ocean, the plankton blooms, releases dimethyl sulfide, which then can create more clouds. So those are examples of these balancing um, sort, of, um, sort of loops on Earth. Um, so this will very likely be a short answer question on your next exam, telling me what a, a feedback loop is and giving me examples of both positive and negative feedback loops. So be sure that you understand this concept uh, and please do not give me any um, examples that do not revolve around the earth or climate. So if you Google this and Google will give you the act of childbirth as being a feedback loop, please do not um, reference that because we don't talk about childbirth in this class. Um, all of this, in short, also gives rise to something called the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect is a good thing overall, right? 
um, bless up to our wonderful atmospheric gases, which create a beautiful blanket that traps this outgoing radiation. So our, our planet is always emitting, uh, always emitting heat at all times. We're only getting external heat half of the time, right? Because the sun only shines on half of our earth at a time, but we're always emitting energy. We're always emitting heat. So because we have these um, molecules and gases in our atmosphere, it traps that outgoing heat, right? So the larger the concentration the atmosphere has of this particular gas, the greater the likelihood of that gas trapping heat. Um, a way that you can also think about it in terms of like the earth always radiating heat, if you take your arm, right, and then you hover your hand over your arm, you can feel your body heat off, of, if you like hover it really closely, you can feel the heat radiating off of your skin, right? Similarly, if the sun is shining um, on a building, the building's absorbing that heat. At night when the sun goes down, you can like walk by and you can feel the heat radi radiating off of that building. Um, so and another analogy that you could think of in terms of greenhouse gases and the greenhouse effect in trapping heat is when you wear a hoodie or when you wear um, a, a coat or you get in bed at night and you have a blanket on. Um, that's trapping your outgoing body heat, which then as a result will warm you up. Um, and so the more materials you have covering your body, trapping more heat, the more heat will be trapped, right? And some gases, some materials are better at trapping heat than others, right? Think about like uh, a sort of like cheaper material that's really thin. That's not going to trap as much body heat. But then say you have like the quintessential techie Patagonia um, puffy jacket, then that's going to trap a lot more of your outgoing body heat, which will thus keep you warmer, right? Or, and or, to get to this idea of larger concentrations, if you put like 15 layers of the same material on, you would, you would still trap more of your body heat than you did with one layer, right? You're just adding more of that material, which would then make you warmer. So, of course, some buzzword greenhouse gases include um, you know, carbon dioxide, which we've talked about at length, methane, um, which comes from cow burps, and something that I think I've forgotten to mention in lecture, methane also comes from landfills and the decomposition of our trash, um, whether it be compost or just regular trash. Um, and then water vapor is also the strongest as well. So here's just a visual representation of that idea. Um, if we did not have an atmosphere blocking or, excuse me, absorbing and re-emitting um, our outgoing body heat or excuse, our outgoing earth heat, we would not be as warm as we are today. We'd be at an, about negative 18 degrees Celsius, which is roughly, um, I want to say like negative 25 degrees Fahrenheit. And that'd be our warmest temperature <laughs> um, on average. But since we do have a beautiful atmosphere that traps and re-releases excuse me, absorbs and re-releases our um, outgoing energy, then we sit at about 15 degrees Celsius on average, or roughly 56 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's our quick introduction to some of these topics about climate change um, before we jump into the full nitty-gritty details of how and why that happens. So thank you so, so much for watching, um, and I will see you upon my return. Thank you.